What if you had a clear guide as you went through menopause on how to beat the hot flashes, how to get rid of the belly fat, and it involved simple, actionable steps that you could take at home? This is what we're going to discuss today on Thyroid Strong. I sat down with Esther Blum. She is an integrative dietitian, menopause expert, and we chat about living with Hashimoto's and then hitting the menopause phase, which can feel like we were hit by a bus twice over. Esther shares how to navigate menopause like a rock star and gives you tools to feel like your best self. Esther is an integrative dietitian and a menopause expert. For the past 27 years, she's helped thousands of women master menopause through nutrition, hormones, and self-advocacy. She's a best-selling author of a book that we'll talk about today, See You Later, Ovulator. She's also the author of Cave Women Don't Get Fat, Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous, Secrets of Gorgeous, and the Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous Project. So many books. I don't even know how many how she has time to write all these books. It's tremendous. She's known as Gwyneth Paltrow's menopause mentor and by Forbes for helping women thrive through menopause. Esther Blum, welcome to Thyroid Strong Podcast. You are one of the few people who've actually been on two times. This will be your second time. I am so honored, Emily. That's amazing. Thank I know. You. First time was pre-COVID. Yes. Oh my God. It was in your oh, New York office. I mean, yes. memories, memories, like the corners of my mind. I know. Oh, so yeah. I want to talk about, so you have this book, see you later ovulator, which I love the cover. It is so badass and the font and everything. And it, you are so funny. Like I was reading this last <laughs> night and my husband's like, why are you laughing? And I was like, <laughs> you don't get it. But, and we'll dive into some of the humor in this, which I love. So this is for, this podcast is for the women who are told these things, right? Your labs are normal and you look fine despite your symptoms. Maybe they've been told you're just getting older or they're told birth control is your only option for your symptoms. Or last one, this is common for your age, right? I'm literally reading this from your book. So I'm sure a bunch of women just raised their hand and was like, yes, that's me. <laughs> A lot of women with Hashimoto's get diagnosed with Hashimoto's when they are going through menopause. Can you explain why that is? Yeah. Well, I mean, menopause changes so many things. It's extraordinary. You're, you're backing out of, remember how chaotic it was when you got your period and the extreme mood swings and you'd be like happy one minute and absolutely crying the next and then enraged the next and cramping and bleeding and just a hormone shit show. And so menopause is similar, except now you're not going into it, you're backing out of it. And it brings on so many changes in the body. Some women get, you know, Epstein-Barr reactivated. Mm. Um, some women develop Hashimoto's, some women develop migraines. Um, there's so many gene, so many genetic influences that happen with hormone changes. But, you know, with Hashimoto's, I really look to the changes that happen in the microbiome as well, because most people don't think of the gut when they think of menopause, they think of, oh, adrenals or ovaries or liver maybe, but they're not really thinking of the gut. And with the decline in estrogen and progesterone, you do see changes in the gut wall in your digestive capacity. Um, a lot of times I see H. pylori happily set up a home and turn in a woman's uh, in small intestine or it moves to the small intestine from the stomach and shuts off the production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And under those circumstances, right, hydrochloric acid is a firewall. So under those circumstances, you know, all of a sudden you can get bacterial overgrowth and dysbi uh, dysbiosis and overgrowth of autoimmune stimulating bacteria. And so that can trigger the genes for Hashimoto's to express themselves. So really anytime you have any autoimmune condition, you want to work on optimizing your gut function and balancing out your microbiome, killing off H. pylori or pathogens and reestablishing fire in your belly with digestive enzymes, because that alone can really have an impact. And of course, diet, you know, really watching 
your triggers or food sensitivities, gluten in particular can be problematic. Um, so you can really get your antibodies under control. That all plays a role. Right. So progesterone and estrogen decrease during menopause, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you talk about kind of going to what you just said, that there's this collection of bacteria in the gut called the estrobolome. What does that do? Because I've actually never heard of this. You heard it. You hear, you know, like microbiome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the estrobolome are the subset of bacteria that help you detox and eliminate estrogen in your gut. So you eliminate estrogen phase one and phase two detox happen in the liver and phase three is in the gut. If your um, estrobolum is not functioning properly, you can get an elevated enzyme called beta glucuronidase, which can give me insight into, you know, your systemic inflammation, but also whether or not you are reabsorbing estrogen into the gut wall instead of excreting it as you should. This is why pooping is so important to do every day, one to two times a day, because that is how you eliminate hormones. So if you're someone who's considering hormone replacement or you're on hormone replacement and you're not pooping every day, you know, you're not eliminating estrogen or moving it through your system the way it should be moved through your system. So this can happen, you know, when you have PMS, if you're still cycling, you can have high beta glucuronidase, you can be estrogen dominant because you're not excreting it well. You can even be estrogen dominant in menopause where your ratios of estrogen, we have numerous types of estrogen that I look at on the test. There's 2OH, there's 4OH, there's 16OH. And if 4-OH is elevated relative to the two and the 16 forms, again, that's the more pro-inflammatory type of estrogen and it's linked to hormone related cancers. So you just want to make sure your detox pathways are really up to snuff in both your liver and your gut. What about the woman that's like, I had a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. What should I be having uh, menopause symptoms? Could I have oh. menopause symptoms? Oh yeah. I mean, a hysterectomy can throw you into menopause symptoms overnight, especially if you've had your ovaries removed, you will go into menopause literally overnight. That's surgical menopause. Um, if you've only had your uterus removed, then you may have premature ovarian failure because there's less blood supply to the ovaries. And that can also send you into menopause earlier than you may have other gone into otherwise gone into so yes, both can absolutely, you know, cause hot flashes, insomnia, weight gain, irritability, brain fog, all of these symptoms where you're like, I don't understand what happened. I'm gaining all this weight. Like, I don't feel like myself anymore. Of course you don't, because you do need, you are going to want to go on um, hormones, especially to maintain your bone density. And especially if you're younger, like I had a 41 year old woman reach out to me last week. She was terrified of hormones. I was like, you, you got nothing to fear girl. And if you don't, you're going to really, you know, lose bone prematurely. So it's, it's such a shame to me that if, if a woman goes through a hysterectomy that she's not educated on like, Hey, you know, you really should go on hormones and, and some surgeons are really good and do educate, but the GYNs won't. There's like such, such a gap in the knowledge for women because this knowledge is critical. Yeah. We'll, we'll dive into hormone replacement therapy, but I want to address one thing that I hear a lot of, which is you, I think you call it the menopot. <laughs> I do. Mm -hmm. Um, and women are like, I just can't get rid of it. Like, how do I get rid of it? Can you explain what that is yeah. and how women can lose it? Yes. Well, the menopot starts, you know, it, it really starts with poor sleep, believe it or not. Um, as our progesterone levels decline, and you'll know, people say to me, by the way, Emily, like, how do I even know if I'm in perimenopause? When does it start? Start paying attention to your cycles and how tough your cycles are. Some women don't notice at all and their cycles are fine. For many of us, you know, they notice like, hey, my PMS is really getting worse for like longer stretches of time. The first half of my cycle, I'm just, I feel great. I'm in, I'm feeling myself. And the second half, like, lay me out on the floor. All I want to do is nap and snort lines of chocolate chips. I'm just exhausted and my <laughs> sleep really sucks. Right. So, and then you're irritable and brain foggy and it's like this whole cascade. So 
when your progesterone declines, you're not making those calming neurotransmitters to help you sleep at night. So you're tossing and turning your sleep quality isn't as good. If you wear an Oura ring, you can, you can track it that way too. Um, so in those cases, you start to become insulin resistant. Even after two weeks of poor sleep, you become insulin resistant. And so your insulin isn't reaching your targeted cells. And a lot of times you're, you know, especially if you're having more carbs than your body needs, it can really get stored around your midsection as fat. That's step one. Um, step two is uh, increased cortisol levels. You know, it's Cortisol and insulin really become dysregulated a lot of the times in perimenopause. So that's why like stress management is such a foundational piece. And people are like, I, I'm not good at meditating. I, if you can breathe, you can meditate. If you've ever had an idea in the shower or while you're driving, you're actually in a meditative state and your brain's very calm and you're in a flow state. That is meditation. So I recommend using apps. I use Insight Timer every night, uh, but people love Calm or Apple or, or just uh, some people do like Transcendental Meditation. Joe Dispenza has meditations. I mean, whoever floats your boat, you really need a minimum of 10 minutes a night um, I or, or any time during the day, but I like at night because it really does set your nervous system up. Um, and certainly also really changing your diet can help with the menopause too. Yeah. So you, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. You talk about cortisol as Goldilocks. Mm -hmm. Why is that? You want to get the amount just right. Like some cortisol is good. Cortisol is not the enemy. When you're working out, you want your cortisol to go up. That's going to power you through your workout. And then you want it to come down after. You also want your cortisol to come up during the day so you get your ass out of bed and you can function all day and then you want it to come down at night. And a lot of times I see women where the cortisol curves kind of reversed where they're, you know, slumming it during the day and then burning it up. It's, it's like on fire at night and they can't sleep and their cortisol levels are very high. I look at you know, cortisol curves on a Dutch test and you can really see what's going on. But the good news is like, it's not out of your control. There's a lot you can do to help support cortisol yeah, and balance it out. Yeah. So let's, um, you mentioned diet and you talk about protein is the dominatrix of your brain and carbohydrates <laughs> are its pitch. Pitch. <laughs> so good. <laughs> um, and you and I, you know, yeah. I preach a, uh -huh optimal, which might be considered high protein for a lot of people. And you do as well. Can yeah. you talk about why protein is so important, especially during menopause? Yeah. This is the time in life where we are at risk of losing the most muscle mass in the shortest amount of time. I mean, aside from elderly, you know, uh, but this really kickstarts it again. We are with declining estrogen, progesterone and testosterone and DHEA we really are not as set up metabolically to optimize um, building muscle. It can be done, okay? It, it can be done. It's a slow process. A woman in optimal conditions can put on half a pound of muscle a month. So you can still gain muscle, but you do have to work at it and you do have to give your bodies the tools to do it, which I'll go into in a minute. The other reason why you want to optimize muscle is because number one, there's a much higher correlation of um, better bone density, longevity, um, insulin management, you know, a lean body when you have more muscle mass. The less muscle mass you have, the higher your risk of mortality, the higher your risk of fractures and falls. It's like the number one leading cause of death in elderly people. So you want to make sure that you're optimizing it now, but plus like who doesn't want their ass to look good in a pair of jeans? Like, I mean, <laughs> right. Really the more important piece, <laughs> more the more, more important piece. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. You, you definitely want to, you know, be photogenic from all sides if possible. So, yeah. so that's really key. And so diet and exercise are going to have the greatest influence. I mean, diet's really like 80%. And most women are not only under eating protein, they're just under eating calories. Uh, so many women come to me saying, I can't lose weight. I, I'm eating so well. I don't understand. And they're eating like 11 to 1200 calories a day. I'm like, dude, 
what you eat in a day, I could floss my teeth with for a snack. Like that's nothing. We need to get your calories up and diet them up before putting them in a deficit. And also I have seen chronic dieters with suboptimal thyroid function as well. So ladies, like your body knows better. Your thyroid's just going to shut down if you don't eat optimal um, calories and for thyroid ladies, carbs too. So let, let's talk about diet and why we need, um, opt well, my three mental laws for fat loss. Okay. Number one, and this is in menopause. Okay. Um, but it applies a lot of other times in life too. So optimizing your protein for the average woman, this ends up being four to six ounces at a meal three times a day, or if you intermittent fast, you know, get it, you could get in seven or eight ounces of protein at two meals a day, and then a snack in between, or just make sure, you know, a hundred grams minimum a day, ideally 120. I have some of my clients on 150 a day, I base it on their weight, either their ideal body weight or their current weight, depending on where they are with their goals. Um, and so most people say, I don't even know how to eat that. That's not possible. If you bump up your protein at breakfast, most people are usually better at lunch and really good at dinner with protein. So really the key is to optimize at breakfast. So that means like if you have a protein shake, two scoops of protein powder, not one, but two cottage cheese is great pro is like super, super high in protein. Buffalo, elk, beef, lamb, venison, pork, chicken, eggs, um, you know, turkey, all of those are great proteins. And just try and get yourself used to eating other protein other than just eggs or a protein smoothie for breakfast. You, you know, I eat chicken or tuna many mornings a week. I'll have smoked salmon, I'll have crab meat. I, I like, like to vary it up. Um, so your body doesn't care. It's not going to say, Emily, you can only eat eggs at 8 a.m. and only chicken <laughs> afternoon. Like it doesn't care. So yeah. try and wrap your head around just getting in good protein sources. Beef jerky is good. Like if I'm on the fly, I'll grab some, some good jerky too. Um, and the second is you want to get at this point in life to beat that menopause and really bust up that stubborn body fat. You really want to get a higher amount of protein than carbs. So let's say you're getting 120 grams of protein a day, your carbs, if you start at like 100, that's enough to keep your thyroid, your T4 to convert to T3, okay? Keto diets work great for about three months for a lot of women. They help resolve hot flashes and bust up body fat. And after that, your adrenals and thyroid usually are gonna conk out. And I've seen more women than I can count regain the weight. I never put people on keto diets. Like it's not sustainable either. And it really can screw with your head. So if you feel good, if you're listening to this and you're like, Esther, I do this and I feel great, rock on. But you are the unicorn. You are the exception, not the rule. Most women do need more than 50 grams of carbs a day. Um, and so uh, that's rule number three is have a nice amount of carbs at dinner, like a cup to a cup and a half, because- that bump in insulin you're going to get is going to tamp down cortisol. The two are antagonistic to each other. So sweet potatoes, white potatoes, if you tolerate grains, white rice. I love white rice as a carb. Just soak it for a couple hours before, rinse it well, get lower arsenic levels in white rice. Um, winter squash, butternut squash, if you tolerate beans and legumes. You know, these are like nutrient dense carbs. They're not processed. But if you want pasta, you know, I like um, bonza pasta. It's a chickpea pasta, or I get at Trader Joe's, I'll get like a um, uh, cauliflower gnocchi or a kale gnocchi. And that's like, it doesn't really taste like pasta, but I can pretend I'm not a huge <laughs> pasta person. So I'm like, oh, this is fine. It's just another vehicle to put meat sauce on. Yeah. But make sure if you do those three things, you're going to already optimize your sleep your insulin sensitivity, because we're more sensitive to carbs later in the day, not earlier in the day. That's the other thing is most of us are having like, you know, bagels or avocado toast for breakfast and then a lot of protein at night. And the ratios should really be flipped. We're having super high protein by day because that's going to also support your adrenals, raise your dopamine and serotonin, keep you from that 3 p.m. crash with cravings. 
and the yeah. carbs that you need to sleep. So I got this question. Simple. Yeah, simple. simple. So I got this question this morning and cause I'm a big, like five eggs in the morning, if you can tolerate it with Hashimoto's. And yeah. this woman asked, well, should I be worried about my fat intake? Mm -hmm. And, um, what would you say to that? Yeah. So for somebody who wants a higher fat and higher protein intake, then I say, just be, just monitor your carbs. That's a case where you can go a bit lower carbs you know, 80 to a hundred, but it, it depends on your goals. Also, if your goal is to maintain your weight, then no, I, I don't sweat fat from eggs, especially because they're so rich in choline. Um, and so important for brain health. I mean, they're just a super food. Your liver makes seven eggs worth of cholesterol anyway, just to protect your whole nervous system. So, and that's every day your liver's pumping out cholesterol. It's neuroprotective. So, um, I don't object to the fat, but just again, what kinds of fat are you eating? If you're eating fat from avocados and nuts and seeds and eggs and butter and olive oil, that's great. It is possible to redo fat, uh, to, uh, pardon me, to overdo fat and gain weight. So I would like track your macros and just make sure you're not, and, and make sure your clothes still fit. And if so, yeah. then, then do you have a favorite, on. yeah. Do you have a favorite tracker? for tracking macros? Oh, you know, uh, I like chrono chronometer a lot. Yeah, I like my same. fitness pal is fine. Um, at, with any of those though, don't go by the algorithms. Don't like go by their caloric recommendations, like work with someone to figure out yours. And like, am I trying to lean out? Am I trying to build muscle? You know, am I trying to just maintain myself? That's, and I would start eating regularly, just like keep three days of just business as usual. If you eat the piece of chocolate or have the martini, write it down, kind of start to see your patterns and then think, okay, where can I tweak? If you start by just adding in more protein, immediately you're going to displace other foods because A, your cravings will go away. B, your appetites can be so regulated. Like you can eat a whole bar of chocolate or a sleeve of cookies, but like no one is binging on steak. You're, it's the only nutrient that protein's the only nutrient that shuts off hunger in the brain. It's really hard to overeat it yeah. unless you're in like a hot dog eating contest. <laughs> <laughs> Cody <laughs> Island. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about, cause you touched upon this and I think this is an important point where if you're not eating enough calories, like you're in a chronic caloric deficit, you could still be gaining weight. Cause I think a lot of the people, a lot of the loud voices out there, are like calories in calories out calories are the only thing that matters. Um, and you know, you see women who are eating 1200 calories a day and are still gaining weight. Can you talk about yeah. how that affects the body? Cause a woman who's maybe just heard kind of her mainstream media verbiage is like, okay, well I'm eating less calories. I should be losing weight. Yeah. Yeah. And you do, let me be clear. You do need a caloric deficit to lose weight. Yes. But if you're eating, I mean, I had a woman coming to me who literally ate 900 calories a day and just <sighs> kept gaining and gaining and gain. And I was like, you're going to hate me. I'm going to make you gain about, you know, five to 10 pounds, but I'm going to fix your metabolism. And then we can create a deficit and you can lose the weight. And that's exactly what happened. And, um, you know, your body is going to adapt. And if you are doing caloric deficits short-term and cycling, that is a great way to lose fat um, and really you know, lean out. But you're not meant to be in a caloric deficit long-term. That's why like people follow uh, online programs, various ones. I'll, I'll just name Weight Watchers for one where people are chronically holding at, you know, a caloric deficit and over time, you know, most people, what's the stat, like 80%, 90% regain the weight because yeah. you do have to a, you know, really pick up some weights and build lean muscle and you can't build lean muscle easily and long-term in a caloric deficit. Number two, um, you know, again, your adrenals and thyroid are going to slow down. And over the years too, I've treated male patients who are in a caloric deficit and their thyroid, I looked with their doctors at their labs and saw their thyroid function decreasing. So 
you may need to diet up. And the way to diet up is, I mean, and think of it this way, if you're freaked out about adding calories, just ask yourself how well your plan is currently working. If it's not working anyway, you literally have nothing to lose, literally, because you're not going to lose anything. So start adding in 100 to 150 calories per day for a week or two. And then again, slowly bumping up till your, your goal is going to be 1500 and possibly 1800. That's really the goal. And over time, I mean, your body will thank you. I remember years ago working with a strength coach and she was like, your carbs are way, way too low. And when I bumped up my carbs to like 150 grams a day, I lost five pounds. And I was like, oh, and I am not someone who loses weight. My weight has been the same for, I don't know, 10 years easily. So I was shocked because I thought I was doing everything right, restricting. And she was like, dude, no way. So yeah. the other way to combat and get over the mental hurdle is to bump up your activity, walk more, get 15,000 steps instead of 10 or really focus on, here's a focus on lifting heavier. Here's a cool stat, right? Uh, I have a, a woman who I work out with once a week who is, we do Pilates, we do weights, we do all different kinds of strength. And she was like, you only have to, and, and when I started with her, I could barely work out. I was so sick with Lyme and mold. I had like no cortisol curve, no tolerance to exercise. And she was like, you only have to work 3% harder to actually get to the next level of fitness. And that was such a fantastic motivator for me. Cause I'm at the point now where I'm like, push me harder. This isn't, I'm not dying yet. I have room in the tank, push me harder. And then she kills me <laughs> and I'm like shaking and sweating, but it's, it's good because mentally it's good to challenge yourself and you do, you, you do. So again, if you're trying to lean out, right, bump up your calories, bump up your activity, and you're going to see nice shifts in your body composition. Yeah. 100%. Let's talk about hormone replacement therapy. Cause that's a big topic with menopause. Um, first of all, you are a fan of hormone replacement therapy. I am not only a fan, but it's why I wrote the whole book. See you later, yes. ovulator. Cause women should, they're not, they shouldn't be deprived of this knowledge when the science is all there. Yeah. I think there's maybe a narrative out there of like, I'm going to do it naturally. Mm -hmm. um, which is there really any benefit to that? It's kind of this weird same thing with Hashimoto's, right? A lot of women are like, I'm going to heal naturally. It's like, okay, if you need the meds, take the meds. It's like, you're going to feel yes. better, you know? Yes. No, uh, I mean, it naturally works great when you're pre, pre perimenopausal, right? You can get your chase tree. Uh, you can get your progesterone up with some chase tree and again, lifestyle, right? You can try some seed cycling. You, you can do all sorts of lovely things. Once you're, and you can take your green juices and yoga and all that. Once your ovaries stop producing hormones, that does not come back. It never comes back. Your body's saying, you don't need to ovulate anymore. I'm just going to really cut down making your progesterone. We're going to switch everything over. We're going to like restaff your endocrine system, right? And move everything from your ovaries over to your adrenals now where they're going to sputter out very small amounts of hormones um, if you have decent adrenal function. And if not, good luck having any kind of energy or sleep without hormone or cortisol curves without hormone replenishment. Now, again, I work with women who have had estrogen dependent cancers. They are terrified um, and they don't want to go near hormones for those women. Or if a woman just says, I just don't want to do it. I do give alternatives, but I do not see the results and clinical research will show you the results are not the same. So look at bone density, for example, you can do your strength training and eat protein and take your calcium and D and K and magnesium without estrogen in the picture. You do not have the same results of optimizing bone density. You don't have the same results of optimizing gray matter in the brain. There are bona fide shifts and a decrease in gray matter in the brain without estrogen present. So Think of the implications of this. 
Alzheimer's, for example, and cognitive decline, you know, well, cognitive decline can start early, but Alzheimer's takes about 20 years to show up, the full symptoms to show up. What happens typically 20 years before Alzheimer's is menopause. And so you think if every woman got hormones the way she was supposed to, we could clean out probably 70% of memory care units. We could save trillions and trillions of dollars by giving micro doses of estrogen. It's profound. So I'm like, how is the knowledge not out here and not accessible for women? It's like, it's just the greatest crime against women. It really is. Yeah. What are some of the best types of hormone replacement therapy? Mm. So I love bioidentical hormones. And here's the thing. A lot of people say to me, I can't afford this. This is too expensive. You don't have to have bioidentical hormones compounded for you. You can actually get FDA approved bioidentical hormones. I have filled a prescription for Prometrium, which is a bioidentical progesterone for $3 at the pharmacy. $3. That is less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Um, same with estrogen. So I, I do love bioidentical forms. They are plant-based. They are easier to customize and titrate the doses. Um, and they have less potential side effects than, uh, you know, the synthetic derived forms of estrogen or, or hormones. The synthetic forms of hormones are linked to cancer far more than bioidentical forms. Okay. Mm. So I'm going to read off just some brand names. Maybe you can list yeah. these in the show notes, but yeah. for women, when they're like, I don't even know what to ask my doctor for. Okay. First of all, progesterone. Why do we want progesterone? And progesterone, by the way, I try to get women on it as early as possible because even if you're cycling, you can start progesterone. You just use it during the second half of your cycle, during the luteal phase. So Prometrium is bioidentical progesterone. It hits up the GABA receptors in the brain and it helps you release those calming neurotransmitters so you fall asleep. It's amazing. It also helps take the edge off your irritability and it's going to oppose those super heavy hemorrhagic periods that you're getting with clots. Those happen when you have high amounts of estrogen and low amounts of progesterone. So you can offset these crazy symptoms. Um, the, the studies that linked estrogen to cancer were because the doctors gave women synthetic estrogen only and no opposing progesterone. That is never how hormones occur in the body. They are a symphony. They're not solo artists, right? So you have to give them together. So Prometrium is bioidentical. Next, you can bring in vaginal estrogen. And I love the work of Dr. Rachel Rubin. She is, uh, she is a urologist and a sexual health uh, expert. And she talks about how every woman above the age of 45 should be on vaginal estrogen. And I wholeheartedly concur because women notice that they're peeing more at night. They notice they're getting more UTIs. They are having vaginal dryness painful sex, low libido. That is because in the decline of estrogen, the vaginal walls thin and weaken, and you can have micro tears. I mean, ouch, that mm. is so painful. And you can, um, again, have a weaker pelvic floor, uh, more urinary incontinence, or having to get up more to pee. Vaginal estrogen is something that you do need to use the rest of your life. Um, but it's, really a lifesaver. You can insert a cream or a tablet. So uh, the Vagifem is like a vaginal tablet, um, like an insert, or there's estrace cream, or there's rings, there's estring or femring. So those are all like incredible, life-changing, life-changing quality of life products that you can use. And then Later on in the game, if you want to bring in estrogen, I do recommend transdermal. It bypasses the liver and the gut. And it's just, you can slap on a patch that you only need to change every three days, or you can use um, topical topical estrogen as well. And it's, it's really, really simple. So the patches, there's um, 
there is Allura, there is Nanostar, there's Vival, Vival Dot. Those are all really simple ways to apply an estrogen patch. So the only rub here is that testosterone is not FDA approved for women. So you cannot get it covered under a prescription. If you need testosterone, you have to get compounded in a compounding pharmacy, which is frustrating and ridiculous, but it can be super duper life-changing with your libido, your quality of life. And you can also get testosterone vaginally as well for low libido. It makes a huge difference. Because testosterone decreases during- Testosterone decreases. And what most women don't realize is testosterone is their pre predominant hormone in our bodies as well, not yeah. just men. So- <laughs> Yeah. And you don't recommend pellets, right? Pellets are like a big no-no. Oh my gosh, pellets. So imagine, think of pellets this way, right? Imagine you've been driving like a Kia, right? Which is fine, gets you to where you need to go, but we're not talking high horsepower here. And all of a sudden you cut, you win the lottery and you're like, I'm going to get a Lamborghini now. And you touch the gas pedal and you're zero to 60 in three seconds, right? So that is what pellets do. You go from having very low depleted levels of hormones to jacking your levels up to three times what they should be. And you have no ability to control the release. So the women, I do have a couple of clients in my practice that swear by them, even though their levels are off the charts, when I test them, they will not go off. But for 90% of my clients, they get pellets, right? Their, do they, their doctor talks them into it <clears throat> against my wishes. And they gain like 10 to 15 pounds overnight. They feel irritable. They have the sex drive of like a horny 15 year old boy, which they do not. They're like, this is like way too much. My husband like is running from me scared. And it takes a long time to work out of your system. And you can also start growing facial hair and lose hair from your head. So the doses in bioidentical hormones, no matter what type of hormone you take are micro doses. They're a fifth of the dose of the pill. We're not trying to get you to ovulate and, and get, and be fertile. We're trying to get you to offset the risk of bone loss, brain loss, right? Uh, Alzheimer's and heart disease. That's it. You don't need to be on mega doses. So people like the research on uh, cancer and hormones has totally been debunked. So let's all go and get ourselves <laughs> feeling <laughs> better, feeling better because your quality of life, it's like transformative. Yeah. Why do you think some doctors dismiss hormone replacement therapy and instead recommend the pill or an IUD? So only 59% of medical schools even have menopause care and the curriculum, and it's not even mandatory. So there was a great article that just came out in the New York Times um, on menopause, and the statistics were staggering of how few doctors, even trained now, are even comfortable prescribing hormones. So that's number one. Number two is you're going to make a lot more money prescribing a birth control pill and an IUD than you are prescribing bioidentical hormones. So, um, and it's, it's kind of crazy because menopause is not a birth control deficiency. You may, you may need to use the pill or an IUD for birth control, but the pill and the IUD are designed to prevent pregnancy and suppress your progesterone. So there are synthetic progestogens in there. They don't hit up the neurotransmitters in the brain. They don't give you that calm, happy feeling, and they will continue to suppress your progesterone. So for my clients that are on the pill and on the IUD, and they say, I don't want to go off it because I'm worried I'm going to have like heavy periods again. Um, and I, I want birth control for those people. We actually add it. We work with their doctor. I can't prescribe, but the doctor will actually add in bioidentical progesterone until they are fully menopausal and then switch over to bioidenticals. Yeah. And you mentioned someone who's 45, so they might be perimenopause. Um, like, do people need to, do women need to wait until they're in like menopause, right? The full-blown symptoms to begin hormone replacement therapy. No, no, you can start in your mid, you know, you, you can start once you're perimenopausal, you can start 
considering looking into adding in progesterone, the second half of your cycle and vaginal estrogen. Just starting those two things can be great. And then you moderate and you keep an eye. I mean, I use the Dutch in practice. Doctors I refer clients to either use the Dutch as well, or they'll add on some blood tests. Um, but either way, and, and don't let a doctor scare you and say, I'm not even going to bother testing you because your estrogen levels are going to fluctuate so much on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, it's true, but that doesn't mean you still can't test and start and listen to someone's symptoms and help them feel better. So yeah. you, you can and should bring things in as early as possible. Estrogen is usually the last to come in. It's the last to, to drop. But once you start hot flashing, you know, I, you can add in, I, I'm a classic example of a woman who is still cycling irregularly, but cycling, and I am on a full cocktail of all vaginal, uh, topical and oral. Yeah. Can you and feel like amazing. Yeah. Can you share some, or maybe one that comes to mind, um, a client success story that's gone through your process you know, probably felt terrible, has, was feeling all the symptoms and probably turned their life around. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, I'm thinking of my client, Jessica, who just was having horrible, horrible periods, like emotionally so um, irritable, terrible anxiety. She had um, terrible sleep. Like she would be up at midnight, like she and her cat would have these snuggle sessions at midnight because they'd both be awake, like dude, dude, dude. cat would sleep on her chest and like that was their jam, right? And she was, and she went to her GYN who had delivered her babies and same thing was like, you can take a birth control pill. And she's like, I don't want to take a birth control pill. Like somebody do something. So she came to me, she was referred by a mutual friend. She came to me and um, I connected her to a functional GYN. We ran her Dutch and her GI map, made sure all systems were go. I got her on a much higher protein diet. She also has a lot of autoimmune conditions. She doesn't have Hashimoto's, but she has um, a lot of joint issues and muscle tears and, um, you know, her, her um, ANA is super high. So we bumped up her protein, worked on her stress management, sent her to her and put her on supplements to clean up her gut as well, because she did have some dysbiosis and then sent her to her GYN and put her on a hormone cocktail. And I met with her just last week and she goes, did you drug me? Like, what did you do to me? And I was like, yes, with a diet and some vitamins and some hormones, we drugged you. She's like, I'm not even kidding you. I don't even know what to do with myself. I feel so incredibly good. She's like, <sighs> I can't, I miss my cat because we don't have snuggle sessions anymore. I'm like sleeping through the night. She's like, I am lifting heavy weights. I feel strong. And literally she's a tiny lady. Like she's probably 110 pounds. It's not like she's eating gobs of protein. She probably increased her protein by three ounces a day. Not a lot. Right. And just, and oh, we took her off gluten too, because she was sensitive to that. What transformed, she was like a different person. And she said one of her friends saw her on, uh, on social media and was like, are you taking metformin? You look like she, you lost weight. She's like, metformin? Like, no, I'm eating protein. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, and I, we were just so joyful. And she's like, what pissed me off, what pisses me off is that women don't have access to this care. I was like, I know <laughs> this is, she's like, it really can be this easy. I said, yes, it can really be this easy. So yeah. What like crazy, crazy. What a transformation. Crazy. What, I what know. A, yeah. What about the woman who maybe feels like, um, you know, cause there's women who are maybe not um, don't have access to doctors who are open to kind of like a more integrative approach or uh -huh. the doctor's like, what's a compounding pharmacy? You know, what, what would you recommend that woman do? I would, if you can, if you have the resources, please go to ifm.org. It's the Institute for Functional Medicine.org and find a, um, doctor there who works with, you can look up every doctor's bio and you can go to their websites and call their offices and say, Hey, 
Do you take insurance? Do you use bioidentical hormones? Do you use pellets? Definitely ask that question. Say, I don't want pellets. Like, give me other options. And um, put put posts up on Facebook groups. You can go to um, menopause.org and find a doctor there. There are menopause experts there. So there are many ways to, to skin a cat. There are doctors that work virtually now, especially after COVID. So there's absolutely ways. And yes, not all practitioners take insurance. I don't take insurance, but it's the fastest, shortest path to your results. It's a permanent solution to your issues. And then you just need to get your blood levels checked like three, four times a year. I recommend a Dutch once a year um, to check. But aside from that, like you're pretty good to go. So yeah, I would recommend you find a new doctor because you think about what your time is worth. And you can, and and how much money you're going to spend anyway and time at these doctor's visits, trying to school your doctor on your own menopause care. When you know more than your doctor, when you have my book in your hand and say, I have 20 pages of studies in the back that show this is safe. Why are you not putting me on this? Like you're, you're wasting your time a lot of times. And some doctors, this is the worst, is a lot of clients will say to me, I left my doctor's office crying. They, or their doctors will say, if you're going to talk about hormones, like I will not see you as a patient anymore. I mean, like hostile, no, go where you are celebrated, not where you are tolerated, you know, go find a different doctor because it will be worth your peace of mind and not having to fight. And believe me, I tried a very circuitous route of getting healing help for chronic. Finally, I was like, screw it, just pay, just invest in your healthcare. And I was like, why didn't I do this sooner? I'm such an idiot. (laughs) Like, I think of how much time I spent looking for solutions when, yes, they're not inexpensive, but I, you know, I get my life back, so I'll take it. (laughs) Yeah, so- Everyone should pick up See You Later Ovulator. Where else can people find you? Yes, please, please go to estherblum.com. Get on my list. Um, I'm going to be having group coaching. Uh, I'm going to be doing so many other amazing things this year. And I send weekly love letters that are chock full of information and resources. And then of course on Instagram at gorgeous Esther, come hang with me there. Cause again, the content's really fresh and there's just so much, so much we're going to get out there. So much Esther. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you on the second time. And really everyone should pick up the book. It is such a digestible read. So for someone who feels intimidated, it is so like written in a way that can reach any kind of woman, right? It's not like super heavy jargon. And it's just, it's so funny. (laughs) (laughs) I was just cracking up. So everyone should pick it up. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you, Emily. You're the best. Thank you so much.